Well, welcome to our Wednesday night class. Tim is out of pocket tonight and had called and asked me to fill in. I know he told you last week, I guess, that you were going to have a surprise. Well, I'm not hardly surprise quality. I think he had intended to make a video and let you guys deal with a little technology, but that did not happen. So I'm as technologically unadvanced as you can get. So it's me. Uh, if you want to pretend it's technology, do this and my lines will squiggle and it'll work out. Uh, let's begin tonight with a prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the blessings that you've given us, for allowing us to work and to do the things that we do. Father, we ask you to bless our time together as we study. Bless those of our number who are sick. Help them to recover. Help them as they go through their various treatments that they will not be overly fatigued and get discouraged. Father, we ask that you bless our young people. We ask that you bless our elders. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, would like to do kind of a, I guess you'd call it a case study. Uh, if you start in 2 Samuel 13. We'll overview 13 and kind of get to what... Uh, we want to do there. David's family, almost as a fulfillment of the prophecy from Nathan the prophet as his punishment from God, goes through a large area of dysfunction. There's a, a young man in his family named Amnon, and then he has a half-sister named Tamar, and uh, he just is infatuated with her and as, as time goes on it, it's almost an obsession um, I have a client who uh, is probably the most severe case of sexual addiction I've, I've ever seen he's in recovery uh, he's trying to get back with his family. He uses this story to explain sexual addiction. Sexual addiction has basically four stages. There's preoccupational thinking, there's a ritualized behavior, there's the compulsive act, and then there's a period of regret. And if you analyze this story, you'll find those components in it. Uh, he also uses the story of David standing on the, the rooftop looking at Bathsheba. You have the preoccupational thinking, the ritualized behavior, you invite her to the palace, you have their compulsive acting out, and then his period of regret. Not the purpose of, of, of our lesson tonight, but what happens is you get this guy who's infatuated with this girl, and he gets advice from bad people. Hey, you're the king's son, he's not going to withhold anything from you. Just ask him. I'm not going to do that. Well, he says, here's what you do, you pretend that you're sick. You have her come in and, and, and you make a, have her make a meal in your presence and declare your love for her. Well, it turns out that, that he brings this girl into his bedchamber and has all the servants goes out and he assaults her sexually. And after that, the, the, the Bible says that he hated her with the love that he loved her. Well, it just so happens that the girl that he attacks is also the sister of Absalom. So if you'll turn over to verse 23. Two years later, when Absalom's sheep shearers were at Baal Hazar, near the border of Ephraim, he invited all the king's sons to come there. Absalom went to the king and said, Your servant has shearers come. Will the king and his officials please join me? No, my son, the king replied. All of us should not go. We would only be a burden to you. Although Absalom urged him, he still refused to go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon come with us. And the king asked him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom urged him, so he sent with him Amnon and the rest of the king's son. Absalom ordered his men, Listen, when Amnon is in high spirits from drinking wine, and I say to you, strike Amnon down, then kill him. 
Don't be afraid. Have not I given you this order? Be strong and be brave. So Absalom's men did to Amnon what Absalom had ordered. And then all the king's sons got up, mounted their mules, and fled. While they were on their way, the report came to David. Absalom has struck down all the king's son. Not one of them is left. The king stood up and tore his clothes. He lay down on the ground, and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. But Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, said, My lord should not think that they killed all the princes. Only Amnon is dead. This has been Absalom's expressed intention ever since the day Amnon raped his sister Tamar. My lord the king should not be concerned about the report that all the king's sons are dead. Only Amnon is dead. Meanwhile, Absalom has fled. Now the man standing watch looked up and saw many people on the road west of him coming down the side of the hill. And the watchman went and told the king, I see men in the direction of Haranam on the side of the hill. And Jonadab said to the king, See, the king's sons are here. It has happened just as your servant said. And as he finished speaking, the king's sons came in, wailing loudly. And the king too, and all his servants wept bitterly. Then Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amiahud, the king of Gishur. But King David mourned for his son every day. And after Absalom had fled and went to Gesher, he stayed there three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go to Absalom, for he was consoled concerning Amnon's death. Now what you have is this situation where Absalom is basically in, a, in an exile. Some of your versions may have that Absalom was banished 40 years. I think the King James Version, the old King James of 1611, will use the word 40 years. The numbers are real close to each other in Hebrew. David only reigned in Israel 40 years. So Absalom could not have been banished for 40 years, and the story makes sense. So the, the New International Version renders it three years. So Absalom's in banishment. He's out three years. Now, what do you think should have been David's response to this son murdering another one of his brothers? What do you, what do you think David was capable of doing? About anything he wanted to, he was king, okay? And very early on, as you begin to look at this story of Absalom and David, you're going to find a lack of discipline on David's part. And for whatever reason, this son Absalom seems to be able to do about anything he wants to. So Absalom has been banished. He's, he's, he's away from the king. The king is mourning the loss of Amnon he, he, in his heart. He wants to go to Absalom, but because it's probably not proper for him to welcome a murderer back, he keeps him away. So Joab conspires to bring Absalom back to the kingdom. Chapter 14. Now Joab the son of Zeriah knew that the king's heart longed for Absalom. And Joab sent someone to Tekoa and had a wise woman brought from there. And he said to her, Pretend you are in mourning. Dress in mourning clothes and don't use any cosmetic lotions. Act like a woman who has spent many days grieving for the dead. Then go to the king and speak these words to him. And Joab put the words in her mouth. So now Joab is going to manipulate the king. He's going to manipulate the king with a disguise. He's going to manipulate the king with a ruse. And he puts words in this woman's mouth. I think a lot of times people get used and people get taken advantage of because somebody gives them a report that they want somebody else to deliver. They're not man enough or woman enough to deliver it themselves. So this woman goes and she plays her part. Verse 4, When the woman from Tekoa went to the king, she fell with her face to the ground to pay honor, and she said, Help me, O king. And the king asked her, What is troubling you? She said, I am indeed a widow. My husband is dead. I, your servant, had two sons. They got into a fight with each other in the field, and no one was there to separate them. One struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant, and they say, Hand over the one who struck his brother down so that we may put him to death. For the life of his brother whom he killed, then we will get rid of the heir as well. They would put out the only burning coal I have left, leaving my husband neither name nor descendant 
on the face of the earth. Now, can you see what's coming with this story that she cooks up? You understand the parallels here? You have two brothers fighting. Who's that going to end up being? you got one brother who kills the other, and now every, all the other relatives say, hey, bring this murderer home and kill him. And, and she says, if you kill him, I don't have any descendants. My husband's name will vanish from the earth. David's a sucker for a good story, isn't he? Nathan the prophet goes to him with that story about the little lost sheep. And David, hook, line, and sinker. Well, he, he bites on this one too. And the king said to the woman, go home. I will issue an order in your behalf. But the woman from Tekoa said to him, My lord the king, let the blame rest on me and on my father's family. And let the king and his throne be without guilt. And the king replied, If anyone says anything to you, bring him to me, and he will not bother you again. Don't you like the way David takes care of business? <laughs> Isn't that nice? He said, look, if anybody says anything to you, you bring him to me and I promise you, he'll never bother you again. So she said, then let the king invoke the Lord and his God to prevent the avenger of blood from adding to the destruction so that my son will not be destroyed. So she says, okay, you've made this promise to me. You've made this brash brag. I want you to say that, that you're not going to allow the avenger of blood to take care of my son. And David answers, as surely as the Lord lives, he said, not one hair of your son's head will fall to the ground. And then the woman said, let your servant speak a word to my lord the king. Speak, he replied. And the woman said, why then have you devised a thing like this against the people of God? When the king says this, does he not convict himself? For the king has not brought back his banished son like water spilled on the ground which cannot be recovered so we must die but God does not take away life instead he devises ways so that a banished person may not remain estranged from him so she says okay by ruling on my case you've ruled on your case same thing Nathan did to him David says that man's worthy of death Nathan says you're the man this woman says, King, the decision you've made about my fictitious sons is the very thing you're doing with your son. Why has, has the banished son not come home? And then she reminds him, if you spill water on the ground, you can't gather it back up. So why have you let this banished son stay away so long? Bring him back. God does not want the banished to die. He wants people to be reunited. So David realizes you know, he's been taken on this. Verse 15, And now I have come to say this to my lord the king, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I will speak to the king. Perhaps he will do what his servant asks. Perhaps the king will agree to deliver his servant from the hand of the man who is trying to cut off both me and my son from the inheritance God gave us. And now your servant says, May the word of the Lord and the king bring me rest. For my lord the king is like an angel of God in discerning good and evil. May the Lord be with you. And then the king said to the woman, do not keep from me the answer to what I'm going to ask you. Let my lord the king speak, the woman said. And the king said, Isn't the hand of Joab with you in all of this? And the woman answered, As surely as, you're, as you live, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from anything my lord king says. Yes, it was your servant Joab who instructed me to do this and who put all these words into the mouth of your servant. Your servant Joab did this to change the present situation. My Lord has wisdom like that of the angel of God. He knows everything that happens in the land. And the king said to Joab, Very well, I will do it. Go bring back the young man Absalom. And Joab fell with his face to the ground to pay him honor. And he blessed the king. And Joab said, Today your servant knows that he has found favor in your eyes, my Lord the king, because the king has granted his servant's request. And Joab went to Geshur and brought Absalom back to Jerusalem. But the king said... He must go to his own house. He must not see my face. So Absalom went to his own house and did not see the face of the king. So David has got this banished son. He's afraid to bring him back because the, the punishment for what he's done should be death. He hadn't killed him, neither has he sent the bounty hunters after him. He hadn't sent his army after him. And so he's just basically been banished. Joab understands that the king wants him to come back home, but David can't do it and be righteous. He can't do it and be politically correct. He can't do it with any kind of honor. So Joab devises this con game, and finally David sees through it. He says, let me ask you a question. Is Joab behind this? Yes, sir, he is. 
And then Joab falls to the ground and said, look, please do this. And the king realizes he's kind of been caught in a logic trap. He's okay, bring him home. But he can't come to the palace. He stays in his own house and he will not see my face. So David's still trying to keep the young man banished, but at the same time, he's kind of sending this mixed message. He's in the city. He has free reign, but he just can't come see me. And so Absalom is back. Now here's Absalom's behavior. Verse 25. In all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the top of his head to the sole of his foot... There was no blemish in him. Now, I don't want to get the lady stirred up, but this is a handsome guy. From the top of his head to the bottom of his foot, there's not a flaw in him. And I don't know what kind of picture that brings to your mind, but this guy is, is, is you know, he's the, the son of Bathsheba. And so he's, he's a, a, a well-decked-out young man. From, verse 26, whenever he cut his hair... He used to cut his hair from time to time because it became too heavy for him. He would weigh it, and its weight was 200 shekels by the royal standard. Now, there's a, a, a temple shekel, and then there's a regular shekel. So when he cut his hair, and they pick up the, the, the leavings of his hair, he had about five pounds of hair on the floor. What I wouldn't give for five pounds of hair. Wouldn't that be nice? You know, he's throwing that much away and I ain't got that much to spare. So this guy, not only is he perfectly built and he's handsome and he's rugged, he's got this flowing mane of hair and his hair's so thick it gets too heavy to wear. I can't relate to his problem. But anyway, it gets too heavy to wear and when he cuts it, what they, what they pick up from his haircut is, is about five pounds. Three sons and a daughter were born to Absalom. The daughter's name was Tamar, and she became a beautiful woman. Notice he names this daughter after this sister. Absalom lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. And then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab refused to come to him. He sent a second time, and he refused to come. And then he said to his servants, Look, Joab's field is next to mine. He has barley there. Go set it on fire. And so Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab did go to Absalom's house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? You getting a, a, an idea of this young man's character? He said, Look, I want to have a face-to-face -face with Joab. Joab says, Look, I've got you back in Jerusalem. I, I'm not going to be your envoy to the king. He says, I want, I want to see Joab. Joab won't come. Joab won't answer his phone. Joab won't text message him. Joab won't friend him on Facebook. Absalom says, burn his field. And Joab goes to see Absalom. <laughs> so Absalom says, I'll get your attention one way or the other. So, so you can see that this young man is, is deceitful and manipulative and, and almost intimidating. A whole lot like his daddy. <laughs> then Joab did go to Absalom's house. He said, why have you set my field on fire? Verse 32. Absalom said to Joab, look. I sent word to you and said, come here so I can send you to the king to ask, why have I come from Geshur? It would be better for me if I were still there. Now then, I want to see the king's face, and if I'm guilty of anything, let him put me to death. Now Absalom says, okay, if, if I'm here and I can't see the king, I might as well go back to where I was. And you call the king's bluff. He's letting me live here and he hadn't killed me. It's been two, it's three years in Geshur and two years, and it's been five years. Well, if I'm guilty of something, kill me or let me go. But quit doing this, this Mickey Mouse come here, go away kind of thing. And so he kind of calls the king's bluff. So Joab went and told the king. And the king summoned Absalom and he came and he bowed down with his face to the ground. And the king kissed Absalom. So now David has compromised his values. David's compromised his standard. Where David should have punished this son for the murder... Now, not only has he brought him back from banishment, he's let him have run around in Jerusalem, and now he's actually brought him in. He's seen the king's face. The king's kissed him. Basically a pardon. We're just going to kind of sweep this little episode under the carpet. So now the king's in a weakened position. He, can't, he can no longer say, hey, I'm ruling Jerusalem with righteousness. Verse 15, In the course of time... Absalom provided for himself a chariot 
and horses and 50 men to run ahead of him. Now you've got this incredibly handsome young man. He's got a gang of guys. He's got his posse. And he's got his sports car. All right? You've seen the type? He's got everything that a young man wants to have to flex his muscles and show that he's got power. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading into the city gate. And whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for decision, Absalom would call out to him, What town are you from? He would answer, Your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims are valid and proper, but there's no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were appointed judge in the land. Then everyone who has a complaint or a case would come to me, and I would see that he gets justice. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, and he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So Absalom's out here by the gate playing politics. Yeah, Jimmy? Election year. He's promising hope and change. All right? He, hey, uh, you're not getting a fair shake. There's no representative here for you. If I were in charge of your case, this is what I would do. You've got a valid claim. This sounds good to me. These guys come out here and they start to bow down. Oh, don't bow down. I'm just like you. I relate to the common man. He wouldn't let anybody bow. He'd raise them up. He'd kiss them. And he's stealing the hearts. He's running a manipulation campaign. Verse 7, at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Let me go to Hebron. And fulfill a vow I made to the Lord while your servant was living in Gesher, in Aram. I, I made this vow. If the Lord takes me back to Jerusalem, I will worship the Lord in Hebron. And the king said to him, Go in peace. So he went to Hebron. Now, do you believe Absalom made a vow? I don't think so. He's looking for an excuse to get permission from the king. You know, a lot of times we tell folks we're going to do something and then the reason we do it is this and, and the, the real reason we did it is something else. I see a lot of that go on. There's, I, I tell people there are reasons that sound good and then there's good sound reasoning. And he's not using either. He tells the king, I need to go. So he goes. Now, Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel. As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, say these words. Absalom is king in Hebron. Two hundred men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. While Absalom was offering sacrifices, he also sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, to come from Gilon, or Gilo, his hometown. And so the conspiracy gained strength and Absalom's following kept on increasing. So Absalom's gathering this army. He's, he's moving people out. He's going to set up a, a base of operation. He says, now when you hear the sound of the trumpet, you guys announce that I've declared that I'm the king in Hebron. And so he, he reveals himself. Verse uh, 13. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the men of Israel are with Absalom. Now I'm not sure how much... Validity there is that I know there's some. But David gets a report from somebody that says everybody feels this way. Everybody thinks this. Have you ever noticed that when somebody says everybody and you say name two of them, they can't? Hey, somebody complained who? Well, I'm not at liberty to tell you. Well, we all know what that means. Hey, King, everybody has turned to Absalom. And for whatever reason, David is, 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 is foolish enough to believe everybody has turned to Absalom. And, and so David said to all the officials who were with him in Jerusalem, Come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly and overtake us and bring ruin upon us and put the city to the sword. And the king's official answered him, Your servants are ready to do whatever our lord the king chooses. I think that's basically saying, If you want to fight, we'll fight. If you want to run, we'll run. You tell us what to do. But David chooses to evacuate. Now the king set out with his entire household following him. But he left ten concubines to take care of the palace. So the king set out with all the people following him, and they halted at a place some distance away. 
And all his men marched past him, along with all the Kerithites and the Polythites and all the 600 Gaitites who had accompanied him from Gath marched before the king. Now, it, it's very interesting, and we read through this. What you've got is this scene where David's evacuating Jerusalem. And what he's going to do, he's going to leave from the eastern side of Jerusalem, and he's going to go up the ascent of the Mount of Olives. He's basically going to go the same place that Jesus went when he went and prayed in Gethsemane. The Mount of Olives sits right to the east of Jerusalem. It's got a little bit of elevation. You can stand on the Mount of Olives and see everything that happens in Jerusalem. You can't come from Jerusalem and, and approach the Mount of Olives on that side and not be seen. I mean, it's a tactically superior spot. And he's going out there at night. And, and we get wrapped up in the king's withdrawal and these tactics. The thing we miss, he got 600 men here who are from where? Read that last phrase. And 600 Gaitites who had accompanied him from... Where's Gath? It's Goliath's hometown. Hey, these boys are Philistines. And when David was living in the Philistine territories, running from Saul, when he left, these men, because of David's behavior, pledged themselves to him and followed him home. They became his personal bodyguard. Now, I don't know what kind of character of a man you've got to be to have 600 of the rival enemy soldiers pledge themselves to you. I don't even think we can comprehend that kind of honor. So David left the castle, left the palace. He's standing there. These guys are marching by him. And here come the Kerithites. Here come the Plythites. These guys that are from Gath. And David has a talk with their leader. And the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why should you come with us? Go back. Stay with King Absalom. You're a foreigner and an exile from your homeland. You, you only came yesterday. And today shall I make you wander about with us when I do not know where I'm going? Go back. Take your countrymen. May kindness and faithfulness be with you. David says, look, you ain't got a dog in this fight. Why? You, you've left your homeland. You, you've given up enough. Just go back and be loyal to Absalom. We don't have any unfinished business. There's no need for you to have left your homeland to follow me and now be out here running around in the wilderness like I did when I ran from Saul. Just go home. Go back. Peace and faithfulness will be with you. And David says there's no unfinished business here. Listen to how this man replies. But Ittai replied to the king, As surely as the Lord lives, and as my Lord the king lives, wherever my Lord the king may be, whether it means life or death, there will your servant be. Again, I don't know that we can comprehend this kind of honor. I don't know if we can understand this kind of loyalty. I don't know if we can understand this kind of influence. This guy swears a vow to David and he swears it in the name of the Lord. In my translation, the word Lord is written in all capital letters. That means they're translating the Hebrew word, the tetragrammaton. That means the, the personal name for God. This pagan Philistine knows the Hebrew name for God. And he says, as sure as the Lord lives... I'm going with you. If it means I live, it means I die. I'm with you. I've got that much respect for you. I've got that much honor for you. I've got that much loyalty for you. And, and folks, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure any of us have friends like that. I'm not sure we even know people like this. But he's made his pledge to Davis to David. And David said to Ittai, go ahead and march on. So Ittai the guy tight and marched on with all his men and the families that were with him. And the whole countryside wept aloud. Now, is everybody on Absalom's side? Of all the people turned against David? Now, the whole countryside wept aloud as the people passed by. And the king crossed the Kidron Valley. And all the people moved on toward the desert. And Zadok 
was there too. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And they set the Ark down and Abathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. Skip down to verse 30. And David continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered and he was barefoot. And all the people with him covered their heads too and were weeping as they went up. Folks, I don't know if you can picture the scene that the king of Israel, the undefeated warrior king of Israel, has just evacuated his own palace. He's walking in the dark with his head covered. He's barefooted. He hasn't been barefooted since he's keeping sheep for, for Jesse. He leaves his own palace barefooted with his head covered and he's crying. Why? Because he's got an arrogant, manipulative, rebellious son that he refuses to stand up to. You think David can't defend this castle? You think these 600 Philistines wouldn't fight till they had no breath left in their body? You think these Kirithites aren't somebody if David chose them as his personal bodyguard? And yet instead of confronting this young man, instead of saying, look, I'm drawing a line here, he leaves. King of Israel, barefooted, weeping in the dark, walking up to the Mount of Olives. Verse 32, when David arrived at the summit where the people used to worship God, Hushai the archite was there to meet him. His robe torn and dust on his head, and David said to him, If you go with me, you'll be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I'll be your servant, O king. I was your father's servant in the past, but now I'll be your servant. Then you can help me by frustrating Ahithophel's advice. Won't the priests Zadok and Abathar be there with you? Tell them anything you hear in the king's palace. Their two sons, Ahamaz, the son of Zadok, and Jonathan, the son of Abathar, are there with them. Send them to me with anything you hear. So David tells this advisor, he says, you go back. You'll do me more good back there than you'll do me here. And so if you hear anything, you let me know. And by the way, you give this guy bad advice because Ahithophel wants the idea of being the advisor to Absalom. So David's friend Hushai arrived at Jerusalem as Absalom was entering the city. Verse 15 of chapter 16. Meanwhile, Absalom and all the men of Israel came to Jerusalem. And Ahithophel was with him. And Hushai the archite, David's friend, went to Absalom and said to him, Long live the king, long live the king. And Absalom asked Hushai, Is this the love you show your friend? Why didn't you go with your friend? Hushai said to Absalom, No. The one chosen by the Lord, by these people, and by all the men of Israel. His I will be, and I will remain with him. So, you know, Absalom says, how come you're not with Dad? Well, apparently the people have chosen you, and so I'm going to, to, to be on your side. Furthermore, whom should I serve? Should I not serve the son just as I served your father? So I'll serve you. So Absalom said to Ahithophel, give us your advice. What should we do? Ahithophel answered, Sleep with your father's concubines, whom he left to take care of the palace. Then all of Israel will hear that you have made yourself a stench in your father's nostrils, and the hands of everyone with you will be strengthened. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Now in those days, the advice of Ahithophel gave was like that of the one who inquires of God. That was how both David and Absalom regarded all of Ahithophel's advice. And Ahithophel said to Absalom, I would choose 12,000 men, and I would go out tonight in pursuit of David, and I would attack him while he is weary and weak. I would strike him with terror, and then all the people with him will flee. I would strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. The death of the man you seek will mean the return of all. All the people will be unharmed. This plan seemed good to Absalom and all the elders of Israel. So Ahithophel says, okay, now that you've proven everybody you're the man, now that you've taken your father's concubines, now that you've proven that you're the king, here's what I want you to do. You get 12,000 men. And you find him. He's tired. He's exhausted. He's worn out. 
And you find him, you, you attack them, you put terror in their lives, and the only guy you'll have to kill is one man. You kill one man, you win a war. And when you kill him, you bring everybody else back with you. And so Absalom says, you know, I, I think that sounds like a good plan. But Absalom said, summon also Hushai the archite, so we can hear what he has to say. When Hushai came to him, Absalom said, Ahithophel has given this advice. Should we do what he says? If not, give us your opinion. And Hushai replied to Absalom, The advice Ahithophel has given is not good. You know your father and his men. They are fighters. They are as fierce as a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Besides, your father is an experienced fighter. He will not spend the night with the troops. Even now, he's hidden in a cave or some other place. If he should attack your troops first, whoever hears about it will say, there has been a slaughter among the troops who follow Absalom. Then even the bravest soldier, whose heart is like the heart of a lion, will melt with fear. For all Israel knows that your father is a fighter and that those who are with him are brave. So I advise you, let all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, be gathered to you, with you yourself leading them into battle. Then we will attack him wherever he may be found, and we will fall on him as dew settles on the ground. Neither he nor any of his men will be left alive. If he withdraws into the city, then all Israel will bring ropes to that city, and we will drag it down to the valley until not even a piece of it can be found. And Absalom and the men of Israel said, The advice that Hushai the archite has given is better than Ahithophel. And the Lord had determined to frustrate the good advice of Ahithophel in order to bring disaster on Absalom. And Hushai told Zadok and Abathar the priest, Ahithophel has advised Absalom and all the elders of Israel to do such and such, but I have advised them to do so and so. Now, send a message immediately and tell David, Do not spend the night at the fords in the desert. Cross over without fail, or the king and all the people will be swallowed up. So, he gets these two different advices. One is probably the better plan. You find him tonight, you hit him, you hit him hard. But God's purpose was to frustrate the advice of Ahithophel. And Hushai makes a pretty good case. He says, You think about who you're chasing in the dark. Would you go after King David in the dark? This is the guy who hides in a cave and cuts the robe, the hem of Saul's robe off. This is the guy who walks into Saul's army and stands beside him in the dark. And one of his men says, hey, let me hit him with a spear. I'll drive him to the ground. I won't have to hit him twice. David says, now nah, let's just get his water bottle and his spear. And when he wakes up, we'll show him how close he was to death. Would you go in the dark with David? <laughs> Not a chance. Hushai makes his case. He says, these guys are not rookies. These guys are experienced fighters. David's going to be in a pit somewhere. And when you guys march past him and go to his main camp, they're going to crawl out of that pit and be behind you. You'll be, you'll be surrounded on both sides. They'll cut you to pieces in the dark. And word will spread very quickly. Hey, David's out there in the dark, and he's mad. And even the bravest man in Israel will, will, will bow out of this fight. You won't have anybody with you. You wait till tomorrow. You get everybody. Now, the rumor is everybody's on Absalom's side. So let's just see how many people come. And then you fall on him like the dew falls on the ground. And, and we'll pull, if he runs to a city, we'll pull that city to, to, to the sea. So there's the plan. God has frustrated the advice. And so they wait a day. Isn't it amazing how important that one day's decision was going to be in the life of Absalom. I wonder if he'd attacked David that night, how the story would end. But he waits that one day. He waits for, for, for that little bit of delay. Turn on over and we'll, we'll wrap this up. Chapter 18. And David mustered the men who were with him and appointed over them commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds. Now, everybody in Israel is on Absalom's side. So where does David get an army where he can have commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? And David sent troops out, a third under the command of Joab, a third under Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zeriah, and a third under Ittai the Gatai. Hey, folks, this Philistine is commanding a third of the army. Then the king told the troops, I myself will surely march out with you. 
But the men said, You must not go out. If we are forced to flee, they won't care about us. If half of us die, they won't care. But you are worth 10,000 of us. It would be better now for you to give us support from the city. And the king answered, I will do whatever seems best to you. It amazes me that in the face of a personal assault, in the face of a personal rebellion, that David has the wisdom to listen to his men. I'm not sure sometimes when we're confronted and it's on a personal level that we've got the composure to say, you know what, you guys tell me, you know, I think a lot of times we want to go sell our own fights. And these men said, look, if we get out there and we have to flee, they're going to worry about us, they're looking for you. If half of us die, they won't care. The only person they're after is you. They're not going to be satisfied till they kill you. So it'd be better if you don't go into the field with us. And David, as a wise man, takes the advice of his advisors. So the king stood beside the gate while all the men marched out in units of hundreds and thousands. And the king commanded his three commanders, Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, Be gentle with the young man Absalom for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of his commanders. Verse 9, Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule. And as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's head got caught in the tree. And he was left hanging in midair. And the mule kept riding on. When one of the men saw this, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. And Joab said to the man, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I'd have given you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. The young man replied, You couldn't give me a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands. I wouldn't lift my hand against the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Ibishai and Ittai, Protect the young man Absalom for my sake. And if I had put my life in jeopardy, nothing is hidden from the king. You would have kept your distance from me. And Joab said, I am not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins. Some of your versions will say darts, maybe just spears. He took three javelins in his hand and he plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive in the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom and they struck him and they killed him. And Joab sounded the trumpet, and the troops stopped pursuing Israel, for Joab halted them. And then Absalom threw him into a pit and put a pile of rocks on it, and it's left as a monument to this day. Verse 19. Now Amahaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me run and take the news to the king and delivered that the Lord has delivered him from his enemies. You are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. And Joab said to a Cushite, Go tell the king what you've seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Amahas, the son of Zodak, again said to Joab, Come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. And Joab replied, My son, why do you want to do this? You don't have any news that's going to bring you a reward. And he said, Come what may, I want to run. So Joab said, Run. And they ran to the plain. We have to go fast forward. Uh, go down to about verse uh, 29. The king asked the messenger, Is the young man Absalom safe? And Emma has answered, I saw a great confusion just as Joab was about to send the servant's king and me your servant, but I don't know what it was. And the king said, Stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and he stood. The Cushite arrived and said, My lord the king, hear the good news. The Lord has delivered you today from all those who rose up against you. And the king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? And the Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against him be like that young man. And the king was shaken. And he went up to the room over the gateway and he wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. We've gone through this very hurriedly and did a little more detail than maybe we had time for, but, but I want you to understand. You've got a rebellious, arrogant, insolent, selfish young man 
who has no reason not to be punished with the full authority and the full wrath of the king. And yet when it comes time to, to go confront him, David says, you be gentle with him. Well, Joab knows how to solve this problem, and Joab solves it. This man's been after David's life. This man's been after David's kingdom. This man has raped David's wives. And yet when David hears that this young man is dead, he walks up the steps to the arch. And as he's walking up the steps, he says, My son, my son, Absalom, my son, I wished I had died and not you. How can you feel that way about a rebellious son? How can you feel that way about a, a, a reprobate? How can you feel that way about a boy who is arrogant and insolent and deceptive and a liar? Do you remember the verse that says David was a man after God's own heart? That's the way God feels about us. We're rebellious. We're selfish. We're arrogant. We're insolent. And God says, I don't want you to die. I'll die for you. If it takes an Old Testament war story to make that point in your heart, I think it's time well spent. The man after God's own heart said, I'd give my life for this rebellious son. And the creator God of the universe said, I'll give my life for these rebellious sons. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that David is a man after your own heart. Father, we ask that you allow us to understand what your heart is like so we'll respond to it. Father, we ask you to give us a heart like David and a heart like yours. Bless us and keep us in Jesus' name. Amen.